Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Seven Blade uh, Podcast, episode number 20. I'm your host, Jan Kruzma, and this is the first time the show will be in English, so bear with us. Today's topic is about how to create content that people actually need. And our guests today are Adam Rang, the former newspaper reporter who now uh, runs a content marketing agent called Rang Media House based in Tallinn, and uh, William Pepper Ross, who's a programmer and a blogger. Yep. And uh, like we said, today we're going to talk about uh, creating content, uh, what people actually need. But before that, let's uh, introduce our today's guest. And uh, what's the best way of doing it than to let them introduce themselves? So, Adam, a few, few. Uh, in short, uh, what's your story and uh, why do you do what you do? So, I originally worked as a journalist in South Africa, and then I moved back to the UK to work in public relations. Uh, really enjoyed it, but actually, I thought the best part of my job was making and distributing web content. So, I decided to set up an agency that focused just on doing that. I moved to Estonia. Um, I don't yet speak Estonian, so I'm very glad that you're doing this show in English for the first time, but I promise I will learn. William, how about you? Yeah, so I've been working on a computer programming blog, and I write some programming book reviews and stuff, and I have this website. And sometimes I share the content from my blog, and uh, there's been a variety of results from, you know, articles that were almost never read to articles going viral, and there's it's very hard to define what the difference is between those articles is sometimes. So uh, it's a pretty interesting topic for me about how to share and how to create content and stuff. What kind of uh, social media outlets uh, do you use on your everyday life? Well, I love taking pictures and sharing pictures. So I use Facebook and Instagram mostly. I use Twitter mostly just for monitoring news. I don't think it's really a great place anymore for um, for people to be. But um, and, and yeah, that's mostly it. I, I wish I understood how Snapchat works. I don't know if you use Snapchat. Yeah, yes. You might have to show me. Okay. Um, but I think I'm getting so old that I don't understand how that works anymore. You're never um, too old to use anything. <laughs> Um, but I think one thing to remember is that you don't need to be everywhere online. It's better to be really good at maybe one or two social networks than it is to try and be everywhere, try and manage lots of accounts. And that's the same for people as well as companies. So what's your main social media channel? Um, I say Instagram. Instagram's my favorite. In the programming world, there's basically two kind of news channels I've seen, which are Hacker News is one of them and Reddit is another one. Uh, and with Reddit, you have different subreddits. So there's a Reddit for programming, there's a Reddit for Linux, a Reddit for Python, for example. And so if I write an article that's specific to Python, I'd usually share it in the uh, Reddit Python and Reddit programming and see how those articles do and also can share on Hacker News. And the uh, Hacker News is the most difficult to get to the top of. It has very uh, a lot of articles being submitted all the time. So it's very challenging to get to the top of that if you target a smaller Reddit, like Reddit Python, as I mentioned, if you have quality content, it's pretty easy to get to the front page of the uh, news there. What about your in like day-to-day -day life? Uh, do, do you use Snapchat uh, or Instagram? I don't really use, I've shared two photos on Instagram before and I just like haven't got that into the followers and stuff. I've been sharing less than I usually do back in, I was actually uh, one of the first schools uh, to sign up for Facebook at University of Michigan, and uh, I think it was like the 20th school on Facebook. So I was sharing a lot when it first started, but it's kind of like uh, gone down recently. Uh, I noticed that uh, both of you didn't mention LinkedIn at all. Yeah, it seems like uh, adding people are adding random friends on LinkedIn has kind of become a little bit of a joke in the past year, how you endorse people and stuff, I think. Mm, I think you're right there. I think LinkedIn use a lot of kind of growth hacking. So they're constantly trying to get you to promote LinkedIn to other people. And it does seem a bit spammy at times. Um, I think when I had a kind of, when I had a corporate job, LinkedIn was great, but now not so much kind of, especially here in Estonia, you, you get to know everyone in the business community kind of mostly through Facebook and Facebook groups. So um, LinkedIn hasn't been as valuable since I've been in Estonia. There was actually one article I shared on LinkedIn. It was uh, about the Python programming language, and it did really well in this Python group. And it had some uh, affiliate links in there. So people were actually generating money for me by clicking on these links and stuff like this. Okay, but uh, now to the topic about uh, how to create content that people actually need. But before this, I would ask you, what is content marketing? 
in the past, I think a lot of companies focused on either advertising or media relations because it was so expensive to um, make media content and reach wide audiences. So you'd let media outlets invest in that. And then the companies would either try and influence um, the journalists through media relations or they'd rent little bits of media space for advertising. And what we've seen now is with the internet, it's so easy to reach wider audiences. that Companies are investing in their own content, putting it out there. But that means that you need a bit of a different approach. Instead of kind of shouting your advertising messages at people, you've got to make make content that people actually value, um, content that's you know useful, entertaining, interesting. Um, and then you can you can still put your marketing messages in that, but it needs to be relevant to the content that people actually want to consume. Yeah, it seems to me there's a separate phase, which is the content creation, where you're actually writing the article, the title, proofreading, adding pictures in and then marketing that article, either putting in some affiliate link or sharing it or um, kind of trying to upsell somebody on your product, or maybe it's kind of an article, but it's also an advertisement for your product, you know, at the end maybe or something. So there's a lot of steps uh, to potentially market or monetize the content once you have it. And of course, creating the content in the first place is a difficult challenge too. You have to uh, carefully craft the title and you have to make sure the first paragraph is very, very good because people often don't read beyond the first paragraph, actually. You don't. In what I've seen. The people who I think are really good at content marketing at the moment are Red Bull because they, they've got their own media house and they create so much content. And it's not always obvious what the advertising message is, but obviously Red Bull is an energy drink. So they're always producing content which appeals to people who need sharp minds and lots of energy. So it's always like skydiving or mountain biking. Um, and I think the joke is like Red Bull is actually a content marketing company with a smaller drinks division attached to it. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the good thing is that there are far more interesting companies than Red Bull, um, I think, especially here in Estonia. So there's no reason any company can't make themselves interesting through media content. How would you uh, draw the line between doing uh, content and uh, in writing content and doing advertising? I think the big distinction is that people don't actually want to watch adverts. Um, with advertising, you need to place your advert where people are already looking, where there's already an audience, and then you try and squeeze it in. With content, um, you need to create um, marketing content that people actually want to consume and they want to show to their friends as well. Um, so it needs to be genuinely valuable to the audiences. It needs to um, provide them, it needs to reward them with something in return for consuming it. Yeah, I found the paid advertisements either through Facebook or uh, Reddit, they didn't work so well for uh, promoting the article actually and that the kind of organic content where people actually shared it on their own did much better and the paid advertising didn't really work for me that well I think you need to be basically selling a product to do the paid advertisement well and getting a uh, high number of conversions you know the a percentage on conversions is always debatable about what's a good number for a different business you know for some people getting a Two percent conversion is good for other people. They need, you know, twenty percent or something higher. <clears throat> what makes a good piece of content, in your opinion? I think at the moment, it, what we're seeing a lot of in content, a lot of content is quite low quality. Um, there's a lot of companies who feel like they need to invest in content, but they they maybe cut corners by either producing lots of very short articles or they rewrite content that other people have put out. So I think what makes good content is has to be original. Um, and actually make it quite long as well. I, you know, I'm a big fan of kind of long form content. Um, and I, I think there's a, an assumption at the moment that online audiences don't want to consume long, art. they won't read long articles. Um, the data actually shows that a long article is exponentially more valuable than a really short article. Um, sure, a lot of people are going to skim read it, they're, they're going to read half of it, but that's half of a much bigger audience. Mm -hmm. So I would say invest in quality content and spend it's better to spend more time researching and producing one really good bit of content uh, than it is to produce you know as much as possible yeah i would agree with that i've seen the higher quality content do much better and also it's important to be time relevant especially if your content is referring to current events something that happened yesterday for example is a lot more likely to generate discussion and i've seen uh when the discussion gets going even if your article is controversial it's very good to get a discussion thread going on your wherever you shared it. And people will kind of promote the article by just discussing it, even if they're saying bad stuff about what your idea is. If they're debating you, it's actually a pretty good win for you. 
And kind of one trick you can do is, uh, you know, kind of stir up the comment section a little bit. You know, when you share an article on whatever forum or uh, Reddit, Hacker News, whatever it is, you can be the first commenter there and say, like, what do you guys think about this? Or, you know, and try and get people engaged. So it's kind of important to follow your own thread to once you share something or produce something, I think. And I think for from a marketing perspective, it's great when you have clients who are willing to react really fast to that kind of stuff. Um, uh, there's one company in Estonia called Leapin, which provide business services around e-residency. And the morning Donald Trump was elected, we were discussing, you know, how can we react to this? And within a few hours, we were putting out advice for Americans considering to moving to Canada, mm -hmm. why they should also consider getting e-residency. And um, so that kind of stuff, like it's really great when you got, yeah, when you can make it topical and react fast. Yeah, there's uh, ones like you're talking about where it's reacting to what just happened is very good. I've seen where... Uh, I did an interview with this guy who wrote the Linux programming interface. It's a really long book, but it was published in 2010, and it was really high-quality content. But since it's not kind of news-relevant, uh, most people, it got a few upvotes, you know, but it wasn't like something that people want to go and share on their own, really. So, uh, I guess there's a lot of content out there uh, generally, but uh, what would you uh, consider uh, as a really bad content? Uh, well, I guess when you're just trying to kind of stir up people and like make some ridiculous claim that's like, and it's not your field that you're really experienced in, you're just like writing about some topic and kind of, uh, haven't researched it enough, then it can be like really people in the comments can be pretty brutal to, you know, about like, oh, you don't understand the situation or, so it's best to kind of research something pretty well before uh just like spamming it out there like oh this is the first idea off the top of my head i'm gonna quick write an article in 30 minutes and try and share it it's probably not going to do that well like you need to kind of think it through a little bit i guess there's two forms of bad content in that there's there's bad content which makes no impact yeah. um but then there's also bad content that annoys your target audience which is far far worse i would rather yeah. kind of have content that makes no impact than to um yeah Kind of if you if you've got a clearly defined audience and you annoy them in the way you distribute it or you you give them information which doesn't turn out to be accurate or um, it's really bad to lose the trust of your community because content is a long-term strategy you need people to trust the content that you put out yeah it also depends a lot too if you're posting under a company name or your personal name you know uh, if there's a risk if you're posting under your company name you do real damage to the company and there's a risk if you post under your personal name that I don't know. Well, there's not as much risk, but you know, you might like kind of ruin your own reputation or something like this. So. You know, I have to confess, I actually, um, I had a problem recently related to that where I posted an article in a forum and I didn't say that I wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually got quite bad um, feedback straight away. People saying, you know, why didn't you say you wrote this? And and I completely hold my hands up. And, and I said to them, the reason why I didn't say I wrote it is because I'm not a spokesperson for this company. So if I did say that, then I'd be answering com answering questions on behalf of the company. So, um, But I fully understand that. And that's, that's a lesson that I learned recently. Mm. I think companies have a difficult decision. They want uh, people to create content for them. And it's if it's too controversial content or if it says uh, libelous things about someone, which means, you know, says something totally false. You know, if I wrote about Seven Blaze, oh, uh, it's a terrible company. You know, Seven Blaze is a terrible company, and that's my article. Like, it's not going to do well, you know. Like, it's like, so you want to, like, uh, represent yourself well. You know, you don't want to just do stuff to get clicks, like uh, create some crazy, outrageous article to get clicks. Like, sometimes you can see an article will get a lot of traffic, but it's not really good content. And uh, in the end, it can hurt you, I think, to do, like, these kind of, like, I'm going to make the most ridiculous like clickbait title article, you know, and uh, see how it does. It's better to kind of create high quality. We were talking about bad content, but how to avoid creating useless content. I would say talk to your audience. Um, there's lots of, you know, the great thing about the Internet and maybe the bad thing about the Internet is that people are always they're very happy to give you their opinions on everything. Um, and the people you probably want to reach are probably they've probably already formed um, social media groups, Facebook groups, where you can go and talk to them and ask them what kind of content they're interested in. Sometimes I'll post one article to a group and at the same time say, you know, um, I, hope, I hope you find this interesting. What else would you like to see covered in future? Um, and it's really great to take that immediate feedback and kind of then discuss it 
with the client from from my perspective. It, you know, th there's also lots of tools you can use to analyze kind of what are people searching for, then how you can get in on that. But I personally think talking directly to your target audience is more effective. Yeah, you can, you know, look at what your target audience is reading currently or what's getting a lot of upvotes on that forum and what's popular. And you can see uh, what to base your article off of, you know, if it, if it could be popular. I think definitely getting the feedback can be kind of tough at the beginning, too, because most articles are going to get, you know, um, kind of neutral response, maybe some upvotes, but it's very hard to get this article, which is going to get 90% upvotes or, you know, everybody thinks it's really cool. Like this is the most challenging thing, which is to create the excellent content where people actually want to share it. And they're like, wow, this is like, this is real news, you know, not like some uh, crap like on the internet. This is like something I really want to show people. I also noticed that sometimes uh, when I'm sharing uh, long articles about like specific uh, uh, technical topics that I think that is, let's say, really useful for uh, Facebook marketers, mm -hmm. and um, I do see some clicks, but I never get uh, good uh, engagement while doing this. So is it uh, possible to write uh, or to distribute too difficult content? <laughs> I think you're you're probably writing about a topic where there's a huge number of people around the world um, that you're competing with on those topics. Um, it is sometimes good to analyze kind of keywords versus how much content is there actually responding to those keywords. And uh, sometimes you can find um, you can find you can find questions not being answered. And then even in a really crowded field, you can you can provide valuable content. Yeah, you can use the Google Keyword Planner to see how many searches are done a month for a certain term. So uh, you can find out what's being searched for, what what the kind of competition is at that level. And you can t actually target an article specifically at some keyword term, you know, uh, to try and like hit that kind of niche. It's funny because a lot of this started a few years ago when the Huffington Post realized that one of the most googled questions of all time is what time does the super bowl start and no no one was really answering that question so they put up uh, an article kind of what time does the super bowl start it starts at this time um and it was one of their most widely read stories and after that that's when a lot of media outlets started employing kind of people who are specialists in search engine optimization and would scan kind of what are people googling and how do we answer that and that's why all of a sudden you see a lot of news articles about kind of what time does this happen and why what is this yeah, it's also kind of lowered the overall quality, I think, because people are saying, wow, like some article about what time is the Super Bowl is, you know, doing really well for them, generating a ton of money. And then they try and copy the strategy and, you know, have, you know, some article. It's like seven things you didn't know about your cat or whatever. What do you think about uh, why should companies or individual creators care whether the content offers any value or viewers besides the click, let's say? In uh, Google, uh, in Google Analytics, you can see that there's a bounce rate. Basic bounce rate is something that someone, if someone comes to your website and then straight away leaves, but if it's a long article and he reads it, he can still go away. So, I think first of all, you um, one of the aims is to try and get that person to share the article as well. Um, it's to do something immediately after. So, whenever you're creating content, it's always good to think: what do you want the audience to think, feel, or do after? reading this or after consuming this content um, and very often you do one of the things that you want them to do is share the article because they find it valuable um, help get them to do some of your marketing for you um, but also content marketing is a long-term strategy so it might be that this person only buys a product from you in six months time after they've seen a few more articles that you've put out they've seen over time that this company is the expert on this problem that they need solving um, so I think for content always aim for kind of that long-term relationship yeah, I've definitely seen that uh, the stuff that shows up in Google results for me is the much higher quality articles. And even some articles which went viral are kind of missing from Google search because uh, it was just kind of like junky articles. But yeah. And also Facebook also tries to, let's say, fight this kind of, uh, let's say, fake news. What's your opinion about this? I don't know. Have you, do you know, there's, uh, a, I think, the Onion blog or something like this. It's, sometimes it's even funny to read the stories, but... Well, yeah, the thing is every piece of content has an author. So in the end, it's kind of just, they might be writing for a company, but there's still some writer there and uh, it's going to have their own opinions and stuff. So uh, I don't think the kind of, you know, New York Times or the CNN is 
as reliable as they used to be where if they, you know, put out a story, you could just assume that it's like going to be fact checked and everything like this. And now it seems like the quality everywhere is going down somewhat and people are uh, doing more kind of media marketing for their articles as opposed to focusing on like, I'm a real journalist. I want to spend like five hours proofreading my article. Now people are, I think, doing less proofreading. They're shooting out their article faster and focusing more on marketing the article than actually writing great content in a lot of places. I think that hurts in the end, especially. Yeah. In Estonia, maybe, I don't know how much you have read, but there's a newspaper called Postimes. Oh, yeah, okay. It also used to be like, uh, for me, like uh, I really liked reading it, but now when I go to it, it's basically an advertising portal. For, it's like not so nice. So basically they also want to like take part of the ride and also think about the more how to get more clicks rather than providing good content. I think it's kind of a dangerous strategy for a company to re reward based off how many clicks you get as an author because then you're very tempted to use these kind of uh, tricks and stuff to get people to click, which is, you know, like what a lot of people are complaining about with the fake news and everything. I'd, I think you'd be amazed kind of with a lot of these media outlets, just how few staff they have producing news and often they can't get out of the office anymore. Um, and it is worrying that this same... The same economics, which is helping ri the rise of content marketing, the fact that we can much more easily put out our own media content and reach people, that's the same changing economics that is leading to the rise of fake news. Um, I think we should be concerned. Um, but yeah. <laughs> you also see that traditional newspapers are losing readership quite fast now. And, you know, uh, the Washington Post got bought out by Amazon, for example. Really? <laughs> yeah. And some others are having kind of this difficult transition from the paper form to the electronic media. I'm amazed at how different journalism is now compared to when I did it quite a few years ago, kind of just in terms of how we were taught to write a story. Um, the way, obviously, online articles are written a bit more clickbait-ish. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to content, I think it is still good. There are still very good media outlets which we should look to 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 see who's the best at kind of writing headlines and intros. And, um, you know, my one advice for creating content, actually written content, is really focus on that headline intro and um, cover image because that's what's going to influence whether people are going to be happy to share it or not and whether they think it's a quality article and worth opening. Um, yeah, that's a great point, actually. I've seen where I had a very long introduction to an article and people didn't make it through the a whole article because I could tell from the comments they thought I was writing about something completely different. It's very important that your title is catchy and that first paragraph is so important. I usually like to have a kind of summary of what I'm going to be talking about in the first paragraph so that people know like what to expect from the article because sometimes if you you know if you're going to write a book or something your intro might be 20 pages but online it's too long for somebody to kind of get through to see your point you know and I'd rather have a very kind of summary topic at the beginning and explain what it's going to be about. That way, if someone doesn't want to read the article and they want to go straight to the comment sections or something, like a lot of people are doing this, I noticed, uh, with, you know, you can watch on Google Analytics how your article is doing. You can see that oh, there's 20 people on the site now, which page they're on and stuff and how long they're spending there. And you can get just a complete wealth of statistics to see kind of where some article is doing well or not. It's interesting to think about why people share articles and often when people share an article it says a lot about themselves, it's a way of communicating kind of what they're passionate about, what they're interested in, kind of their identity, which groups they're a member of. Um, so you always think when you create article like would your target audience be happy to identify with this bit of content and share it? Yeah, you have to be careful of like kind of some ego issues too, you know, if you put yourself too much out there as like a brag in an article then people won't like it. And if you're too passive with your voice about like, you know, you're not like sure about what you did or something, then people will also not like it. So there's this kind of uh, way of writing which appeals to people on the internet, which is kind of, I don't know how to explain it that well, but you don't want to be like too, like look how cool I am, look what I did or something. Then people will, like have a negative reaction right away. So you gotta, it's a very fine line about uh, saying you accomplished something or your company accomplished something and not have it, sound like uh you're selling something or promoting too much you know we're talking about a lot that you need to write the right content to the right people right mm -hmm. so uh how do you do your research how do you know to who and to what to write 
Well, for the programming blog I was writing, I could write about any topic, and I was trying to keep it mostly focused on programming. Sometimes I'd write a little bit differently. So I think it's important if you have a theme for your website or your business that you kind of don't venture too far outside of there. Uh, you know, I'm, like you might see an opportunity, like we were mentioning, with like what time does the Super Bowl start? That one, if that one really be like a topic for my blog right now because uh, it's more focused on programming. So I would usually check some kind of Python forums or Linux stuff, what's what's going on in the news and see what kind of what's going on in the programming world and then maybe write some kind of, sometimes I might have like a meta analysis article, you know, or, uh, and it's actually good to try a lot of different styles of articles because before you've had success, you don't really know what's going to work. Uh, for the first five articles on my site, I didn't share them at all. And so basically nobody came to the site because I wasn't marketing the articles. So uh, it's important to market the articles too, I think. Yeah. Well, I work for a lot of companies in Estonia and I actually rely on them to give me good briefs about who their audience is because I think it's important that content marketing supports all other areas of the business. So um, sales and other marketing and advertising, we must all know who the target audience is and who who we're all targeting together at the same time and complement each other. Um, so I'm very lucky with my clients. They kind of, they've, they've done their own research into exactly who their target audience is. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'll go off and I'll, I'll get new insights about target audience and then I'll feed that back into the company. Um, and sometimes, you know, we'll, um, while researching and writing content, we'll discover maybe new groups of customers or customers using the products in a way we didn't, um, we didn't know before, in which case I'll feed that back. And then that means everyone can kind of focus on that person, on that group as well. Um, but yeah, for me, content marketing, uh, it's more about, it's a collective kind of company effort to figure out who the audience is. Yeah, I think it's very important to know who you're writing for because someone can be a beginner in your field or they can be an expert in your field. And these type of reactions will be very different uh, based off who's reading your article and stuff and where you've marketing it, where you shared it, et cetera. What would you list as the key attributes of... Uh of the audience, what do you need to know? I think you need to know, uh, one very thing is kind of how do they use the internet? Where do they hang about online? Um, you know, some groups will have already formed communities. So I do a lot of work targeting digital nomads, um, people who travel the world and, you know, sometimes they have to create companies in Estonia or move money across borders and they need help of some companies in Estonia. Um, the great thing about digital nomads is that they organize themselves into social media groups. They've got a really kind of tight knit communities. Um, so yeah, it's great to know kind of what social networks do they use? Um, where do they hang out online? Where's the best place to find them? Um, you know, certain groups might be more likely to use Reddit. Um, they might be more likely to watch how-to videos on YouTube. Um, yeah, I think most important thing, how did they use the internet? Yeah, that's super important, I think, especially where the traffic comes from. Uh, I noticed when you have a viral article, you get a lot of good statistics about where people were coming from. And uh, actually, my website crashed the first time I got a viral article. It was about, uh, when, I, when I got it back up and running, the peak was about 800 people and about uh, 500 people from Hacker News, about 200 people from Reddit, maybe 15 from Twitter, and then, you know, like some scattering of other sites. But I could see very clearly that like Hacker News was the main kind of digester of what I was writing. And then the Reddit was like the next one. But after that, there was a big uh, trail off. And I noticed at one point there was 20 people from Twitter on and it was like that for like 30 minutes and then it fell off. But also uh, one thing about the viral article is it doesn't go viral right away. It took about maybe two hours actually before I, after I shared it and promoted it for it to see like some kind of uh, uptick in traffic. So it doesn't just like start off, you know, like you're on the front page of the internet. It takes a few hours usually of people like looking it over, sharing it and stuff. And then eventually, I guess the way the internet works, you know, then it'll be on top or something. And I guess there's a kind of perception that going viral is very lucky. Whereas actually it takes a lot of hard work to kind of research and write an article which answers the right question at the right time. And then obviously you've got to put a lot of work into promoting it in order for people to discover it and, and start sharing it. Um, yeah, so sometimes people think, you know, just any random bit of content can go viral, but um, you can make the odds go in your favor by doing a lot of hard work. Yeah, I noticed uh, just like the story I was talking about with 
going viral on Hacker News. Actually, the submit I had to Hacker News, it it didn't even get enough upvotes. It fell off the first page, but then somebody else, some other people started resubmitting the article to Hacker News, and then it got like re kind of uh, reinitialized, and people were commenting more. So it's very kind of fine line about uh, what makes it go viral and not, you know, you can share it, some article in a hundred different places and it's not going to go viral. You can share an article just one time somewhere and it can go viral because if it's uh, good enough content, then you can really see it take off. Creating uh, good content uh, all the time is quite a challenging task. So how do, you, uh, how do you maintain the good quality or how do you, let's say, refresh yourself? So I or... I think, uh, you know, my philosophy is that you always think like a journalist or like a media outlet. And I guess when it comes to content marketing, that's what we're doing. We're taking those skills and bringing them into the marketing world. Um, but, you know, when I worked um, for a newspaper, we actually had a big picture on our conference wall of our kind of target audience. And it was literally a family. They all had names. They all had backstories. They all had kind of ambitions in life. And then we'd sit around the, con- sit around the conference room discussing which stories we we're going to write about today. And we would always say kind of, you know, is, is this person going to be interested in reading this story? Um, so yeah, always keep your audience in mind and always think like a journalist in terms of, um, is this an issue that's on our target audience's mind? Yeah. And you got to kind of manage your expectations when you're creating content, not every article is going to be viral. And if you take it personally, it's going to be pretty hard. So it's pretty lucky to have, um, you know, an article do really well. So kind of have to set an expectation, like this is the average article kind of, or a lot of times you think an article is going to do well and it doesn't, or maybe one you thought, I'm not really sure about this one. And then you're surprised that it's doing well or something. So it's, you know, it can range from having just a hundred like viewers to many more you know, and it's, and, it's, uh, and it's not always about kind of um, the number of viewers as well, because it yeah. can go, it can go viral among audiences you're not actually interested in. Whereas yeah. if you can reach a small number of people, but they happen to be the people interested in your product or service, and you manage to reach them with your key messages about why they should be interested, um, then that will be far more valuable than just getting a large number of um, viewers or hits on a story. Yeah, I had some article that was trending on some, uh, news for uh, Czech Republic. It's like some news aggregator for the Czech Republic. And for a day, there was like 20 people on my site from the Czech Republic always. And I was wondering, like, what is this website? You know, it's pretty strange. It had no kind of uh, targeting of Czech Republic, but there was many people coming from there because it was somehow featured there, I guess. Do you have any kind of strategy, specific strategy or tactics you would like to share with uh, our listeners about creating uh, new ideas? Um, for creating new ideas. Um, I, when it comes to creating new ideas, I think talk to your audience and also talk to talk to the social media accounts that you think would be interested in sharing your content. Um, so the great thing about... I, I do a lot of work in Estonia, obviously, and the great thing about Estonia is that we have a very close-knit community online of lots of Estonian social media accounts who, whenever there's something kind of nice written about Estonia, we, we tend to all circulate it together. Mm-hmm. And sometimes... You know, it's important to remember that the people who run these big social media accounts or groups, um, they're real people behind them. You can send them a direct message and kind of um, bounce ideas off them. And, uh, you know, a very important tip actually is to keep a list of kind of relevant social media accounts. Um, You know, maybe make notes. Who runs them? uh, Any notes you need to remember about that person. And actually, it's a lot like media relations where... In the past, you would keep a list of journalists and notes on those journalists. Kind of when was the last time I sent this journalist a press release? What is this journalist interested in? So you can do the same thing for social media accounts. These social media accounts already have access to large audiences. Um, yeah, keep a list of them and make sure you you don't waste their time. Go to them when you think you have relevant content which they would like to share with their audience. You can also uh, create a list of ideas, you know, as you think of potential articles or content to create and sometimes what I'll do is I'll just write a title I I use WordPress for my personal blog and I'll create a a post for the article and I'll just put the title to start with and if I can't finish the article I'll just keep the title there and like hopefully it's going to make me like go back and write about it later so I think it's important also when you get a good idea to write it down you know maybe it's just a thought for now but to kind of keep track of when you get ideas it depends of course how often you want to create content. If you're doing something once a week, it's 
not that hard to get an idea, but if you need to write something every day, then it's much more difficult to find quality ideas, I think. Do you sometimes take breaks, let's say to your client or to yourself that, okay, now uh, I'm run out of ideas, I need some uh, free time at all? Does this happen? I think generally we've got so many ideas that, yeah. I mean, sometimes what happens actually is that we'll start working on one idea, then it goes off in a different direction. Um, we'll do research on it and and I might go back to the client and say like, actually, that initial idea, it's not actually working out. But while I've been researching that, I've discovered this and this. Um, you know, this is two bits of content we can do in future. Um, so I think it is important to keep adapting, stay flexible. Um, yeah think like a journalist if the story changes then write a different story yeah i think it's important to pace yourself too as you're writing content i've found as a personal blogger i was burning out too much if i was trying to do a daily article or something like this and it's i was kind of spreading myself too thin with my ideas you know and uh and when you post under your own name actually and you get feedback a lot of times the feedback can be negative on the internet so it's like you got to kind of manage that with like debating trolls like all the time too you don't want to be like in the comments section, like telling people they're an idiot all the time or something, you know, like can like go down to this level accidentally, you know, so. Uh, Although it is tempting sometimes. Yeah, it's very tempting. <laughs> and actually because like I was saying earlier with the comment section, if you build a bigger comment section, it's like generating more clicks later and stuff like kind of, um, I, I noticed on Reddit, they value the comments very much for how like high your article goes and stuff like this, so. Uh, you kind of want to like engage with the trolls, but not too heavily if it's like possible, you know. Like, Let's talk about call to actions on a post. You said a uh, good introduction. What about the uh, call to actions? Sometimes the contest just doesn't give the necessary results in a way. So, uh, do you have some kind of a system for uh, creating call to action? Do you even need a call to action? Yeah. So. Obviously, always start a bit of content thinking, what do you want the audience to think, feel or do afterwards? Um, I very often do put call to actions on just, um, you know, start your application here or um, or it might be just, you know, something to keep them interested, kind of to maybe point them in the direction of another bit of content. Um, what I find quite effective is to have have both very overtly promotional content and less overtly promotional content and have the less overtly promotional content leading to the overtly promotional content if you are uh, if you're still with me on this one <laughs> okay so it might have one article which is why this company is so great but then you create another article kind of more broadly about the topic that would appeal to customers of that company and then at the end of that article it would lead to kind of oh by the way this is the company that you should check out then it leads through to the other article why this company is so great so if you think your target audience will start off on social media or search engines, they'll they'll Google, they'll search for this question that they want the answer to. It'll lead through to one article which has very kind of general good advice. And then it'll lead through to another article once they're ready to take the next step to this is the company you should find out about. Um, so I find that quite effective. Nice. When I was first starting, I was doing just a lot of experimenting and seeing what articles would work. And then eventually I was kind of trying to guide people to view the book review section of my website, which had some book reviews of some programming books and stuff. And actually these were uh, Amazon affiliate links to Amazon. So if someone buys something there, I would get 5% or something like this. It's actually a pretty nice program. But uh, I haven't really like done that many kind of, I'm not selling a product on my website, so I don't have, I think if you have a product-based website or company, then it's very important to kind of, uh, like as you were saying, like lead them through the steps of here's like some article, which is clearly not a promotional piece. But on the website, there's like kind of a sales pitch and maybe a more expensive thing. And you kind of have to guide them through this process of like you read this article and then at the end, maybe it directs you to some landing page for a product if they're interested more or something or sign up for the service or email newsletter. or However, the website is kind of uh, monetizing, you could say. And this is why content is a long-term strategy because it does take time to create a network of content which leads people there. But, and, you know, at first, if you just write one very overtly promotional article, it's really not going to have much impact. But the more you can add to this network of content, um, useful content leading back to that company, um, the more effective it will get. I also noticed in Facebook, uh, often when I uh, use caps lock for words like share or like or comment and 
people uh, maybe they're too lazy to read the whole thing, but then they see the caps uh, like emphasized word, and then they do that action. So this works also really well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I haven't tried with that hacking yet. <laughs> So um, we already talked a little bit about viral marketing, but um, let's go back into it. That uh, every 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 one of us wish that each single of our content would go viral in a way. And very often, uh, clients have come to me also that oh, we, let's do something viral. So uh, can you actually do something viral, or is viral that something that happens? Yeah, and if I could do something viral, I'd be a millionaire. Um, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I'm not yet. Uh, so I think it is important to manage clients' expectations and focus more on, you know, what we're going to do to reach our key audience. And you know, the more people, the more, the wider the key audience that sees it, the better. Um, yeah. Um, and, and sometimes I'll be honest. You know, I look back at the content we put out last year to see what worked particularly well, and I, I couldn't always predict the ones that did really well. And some of them quite surprised me. Um, so I could sit here and pretend to be an expert on why they went viral, but actually, sometimes you look back and you realize, and then you adapt your future strategy around that. There's also some potential technical challenges uh, when you have an article do very well of whether your website can handle it or not. They even have a term on reddit is called the hug of death which means uh you'll see an article at the top but when you click on it it says the server's down because there's too many people uh trying to access it so you have to make sure that your website can scale because one of the worst things that can happen is you get the most popular article on the internet and your sales page is down or whatever and then you know you're losing you're really losing out a lot there if if that happens and it's kind of hard to predict you know if you've never had a lot of people on your site you don't know kind of how the server is going to handle it and if everything's going to go smoothly. So it's nice to have a good, I guess, technical team ready if, if there's a problem when the article is viral. I mean, you don't care if there's maybe five people on the website and it goes down, it's not a problem. But if there's a thousand people there, it's really going to suck, you know, for your sales and stuff. In terms of this, uh, what do you think about like uh, hosting the article on your own site or hosting the article on a third party places like medium.com or something? So you, you're like less stressful about this kind of uh, hap- thing happening. I've recently switched my own blogging over to Medium and a few of my clients have done the same. Um, at first, I was kind of skeptical. I thought, you know, keep it on your own website, make sure everyone comes through to your own website. But actually, it's, you know, it, it is important to have content in different places around the web, which then lead back to your own website. Medium is a very well-designed um, platform. It's just really easy to read. Um, I, I don't know, you know, whether it's still going to be around in a few years, but at the moment, I think it's very cool. And the fact that, you know, you obviously you're still linking back to wherever you want them to link to on your own website. There was an interesting story about Medium recently that they've uh, increased their traffic almost 300 percent, but actually they're still losing money. So they're trying to figure out how to make money on on the product. And I think it's actually a very nice product for the people who don't want to spend the time to build their own website, which is technically challenging. I'm a programmer and it's like pretty hard to do sometimes, you know, to mm. have everything set up. So Medium is actually really nice, I think, for if you don't want to worry about the technical side and you want to be able to share stuff and you don't want to worry about like if there's going to be too many people on the site, how much is it going to cost, like all these things. Mm. So the e-residency program the, yes. also uses Medium at the moment and their blog is medium.com forward slash e-residency-blog and I would encourage people to go check it out. There's a lot of uh, stories there about e-residents around the world and, and how they're using the program setting up their businesses in Estonia. Can uh, viral marketing also do any harm? I think what we've seen with a few companies is that they've kind of overhyped their product and then they've been exposed when it's gone viral, especially with a few crowdfunded um, crowdfunding products we've seen lately. Fortunately, in Estonia, we have a lot of companies that deserve to be heard. So I, I, I don't think that's too much of a problem. I mean, unless you go really off message, um, you you know, you're, you're off message going to the wrong audience, you're maybe you, you really want to... You want your message to go viral so much that actually you forget what your message is. That's probably the biggest danger. Um, so I would think concentrate on making content that reaches your key audience with your key message. It seems to me like the law hasn't really caught up with you know what you can say online. It used to be kind of in the newspaper that, that things had to be true. 
was the kind of law. And if you said something false about someone, they could take you to court potentially. Or if you said something false about a company, they could, you know, do some legal proceedings. But it seems like with the uh, social media, it's kind of like the wild west of what you can say. And there's, it's hard to know kind of what's the limit of what you can say about somebody else, what you can say about a company before it, it potentially damages. I mean, they had this, uh, there was this uh, CEO of uh, Grubhub and uh, after the presidential election, he said like anybody who voted for Trump should just like resign or something. And it was like way too much for a CEO to be saying about politics. So the stock was down 5% or something after this. I think it's recovered since then, but especially like the people in the kind of power positions in a company need to be real careful about what they write on their um, uh, wall or whatever. I remember there was also the CEO of Netflix and he uh, wrote something about like the third quarter earnings aren't looking that great on his Facebook and the stock went down 20% and people were saying he should leave, he should leave. So it's very kind of people are monitoring people's Twitter accounts, they're monitoring their Facebook and see like, you know, this guy's the head of the company, what did he say? And it can, I think it definitely can be an issue. And some kind of rogue blogger or something can also probably damage a company as well. I think it's a very good idea um, to, when you write an article, to actually show it or just tell people that are mentioned in the article to expect it and kind of tell them what you've written about them. Um, I mean, very often, you know, for a lot of marketing content, you don't generally write anything negative about anyone not that I can think of, really. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good idea just to check with them, you know, have I, is this accurate? Yeah. Am I writing about you in the right way? Have I got your title correct and things like that? And normally, you know, they're more than happy. And actually, it means that you're giving them the heads up to share it from their co co corporate accounts as well when it goes out. Yeah, on a side note, it's always good to have somebody review your article or content and, you know, make sure your picture is good, make sure the title makes sense and everything. Because I've had situations where I've shared something and then showed it to someone they say mm, why are you using that picture or something it's like oh man i don't know or like or that title's confusing and then you know once your article's kind of live you ha i've had this debate like do i go in and try and you know perform surgery on the article to fix it now why it's live or do i just let it sit there with kind of mm -hmm. like the way i don't like it or something you know so that's a good point actually uh, like adam how much have you edited uh quite rarely i think if i I think recently, actually, someone um, wrote um, asking for a change, which was very minor to us, but actually very important to them. So he said, yeah, that's not a problem. We changed it. And it's always good to keep these people happy. Um, it's actually a good idea when you're producing content, if you can, to reference uh, as many relevant people as you can, knowing that they're going to be more likely to share it. So, yeah, do keep those people happy and, and also hyperlink to them. Uh, it's, it's, it's valuable to them. And actually, it's valuable for you as well, because when Google sees hyperlinks and that people are following them to an accurate um, of a site, then they value that site. They value that page even more. I had one really good success story with an article where I wrote about these different Python books and the ones that were my favorites, kind of. And I uh, sent out tweets to the, all the authors saying like, hey, by the way, I mentioned you in my article. And I was only writing good stuff about the book. So uh, like, three or four of the authors retweeted my article and it was pretty nice for my programming blog to make some contact with like these articles with, I mean with these authors and say like hello like by the way I was writing about you and they were all like pretty pleased to reshare it and stuff so what would you like to hyperlink in the Seven Blaze blog when we're distributing the podcast I would like you to hyperlink rangmediahouse.com <laughs> okay will do uh, you can just link to my personal site the, okay uh, yeah williampross.com so and they can see like some of the crazier articles I try. <laughs> okay. Both of you have been writing for quite some time. So uh, could you share with us your uh, biggest mistakes that you have done and what have you learned from them? Yeah, I, I think biggest mistake is actually the one I made very recently. Um, so yeah, I posted an article in a, in a Facebook group and I didn't say that I wrote it. And I completely understand that when people realized I did write it, I can understand why they were annoyed. Um, so I said to them, I, I gave them the reason for why I didn't want to be seen as a representative of the company. Um, but then I also went to the client and I said, oh, you know, this has happened. So in future, do you mind if I do say that I shared this article? Um, and they were completely happy with that. So, and I think it comes on to the point kind of we discussed about, 
you've got to be very careful not to annoy your target audience and especially when you're going into social media groups you know these are very these are very proud communities which if if you kind of spam them and share the same article in lots of different um lots of different groups and you know there's going to be people who are members of the same of similar groups um and if they just see you doing that from a marketing perspective then they can very quickly get annoyed so yeah just make sure you treat this target audience with as much respect as possible and you know hold your hands up if you if you do annoy them and say you know i fully understand yeah definitely getting banned from forums or banned from whatever your sharing medium is can be really bad if you're trying to do it too often and it's very obvious that you're only sharing marketing things only sharing your stuff you know never commenting on anybody else's stuff it can be a problem and I think uh, writing content, it just takes a lot of practice. I mean, it took me maybe 20 or 30 articles uh, to feel like I had like the flow, you know, for writing. And you got to get used to the, whatever your publishing thing is, whether it's Medium or WordPress and stuff. And you got to get used to how pictures appear and, uh, you know, how to create the article and stuff. I think it, it takes some training. And in contrast, actually, when I look back at last year and which article did the best, it was an article which I just posted in one group. And I said to them, kind of, this is why I think you'll find this interesting. Ask me any questions you want. And it led into a massive discussion, um, you know, answering loads of people's questions. Uh, and then it got picked up by uh, a media outlet, which republished it with a link back to the article. Um, so actually, instead of going to, you know, hundreds of groups and trying posting as many places as possible, the most successful one was just posting in one place and actually, you know, giving them the time to answer all their questions. And that was much more effective. Yeah, I've also seen uh, for the programming, I only really share on Reddit and Hacker News now and the, all the other forums for sharing turned out just not to be worth the time. I would start kind of trying to share my article 10 different places and stuff and it was to see where the traffic comes from. I'd suggest like when you're first starting with content, you kind of do a shotgun approach to share it and see what works and what doesn't. And eventually you'll find out like, wow, people from this forum, from this group, they're really like into the content. And then you kind of know, oh, I can just share it there now. And then you don't bother with, you know, I'm going to put it on Twitter. I'm going to put it on LinkedIn, Facebook, everywhere. You know, you don't need to share it on every single like forum and stuff. I think it goes back to what we said at the start, like get really good at one or two channels get really good at you know what you're best at and yeah don't worry about trying to be everywhere yeah you'll find out from how well your articles do kind of what people want and stuff and you'll refine your strategy i think that's really good advice and also good advice for my myself also i also very often try to post everywhere mm -hmm. in groups but we have been talking here quite a while so for you i have uh, one last uh, question could you point out uh, three important bullet points for creating great content? Okay. So first of all, know your audience. Um, you know, speak to them first, find out what they're interested in. Second of all, make it original. So do a lot of research. And, you know, even if you're going to be addressing a topic which which yeah, lots of people have already written about, give it a fresh perspective and um, make sure you're not just copying information that you see elsewhere. Um, third of all, yeah, um, you know, there's this famous quote in advertising, the customer is not a moron and the people you're distributing it to uh, that you want to read it are not morons. So make sure they come away with kind of valuable information that they'll want to share. Yeah, I've noticed uh, in addition to those things, those are all really good points, actually. Uh, the title is very important and the first picture you have is also very important in the introduction because uh, especially for the longer articles, you need to have this really solid beginning where the person's like drawn in. And if anything's missing, like the title, it's like a little bit, the title can make the entire article. You can have a great title and get uh, tons of traffic just off that almost because people like, they'll go to the discussion or whatever, you know, and start debating people. Or, But you also need a good summary, I think, at the beginning of, or an in introduction. And I'm sure you're the same, William, but I spend a huge amount of time, a disproportionate amount of time writing that introduction, writing that headline yeah. com compared to the rest of the article. Yeah, exactly. I've seen so many articles uh, kind of, you know, drop off and I realize, oh, the, damn, the title's not like that good, you know, like or something. I've seen an article catch on which had a really good title in that very intro. And um, 
You can notice actually when you share an article, especially on Reddit, you get upvote. It says how many upvotes you got on the side. So if you share an article and you see you're below 50% upvotes, you know, something's like kind of off probably with your title or your intro that's like annoying the reader for some reason. You might not know why right away. And then sometimes, you know, 30 minutes after you share, someone writes a comment. Oh, by the way, like your facts are completely wrong or something. And you're like, oh, okay, I can correct that or it's not correctable or something. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. And next time we'll do this in Estonian, should we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try and learn. So thank you, Adam Rang, and thank you, William P. Ross, who talked today about creating content online. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, listeners. This was the Seven Blaze podcast number 20. Uh, Hendrik Weyer is in charge of sound from Lakeside Sounds. Thank you. And uh, definitely listen to our previous podcast episodes on sevenblaze.com slash blog on iTunes or on YouTube or straight from uh, soundcloud.com slash sevenblaze social. Hear you soon. Be social. Thank you for the show. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Woo!